Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's Light Reading webinar, Designing the 5G Connectivity Challenge, sponsored by ECI. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up by email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you do have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resource list widget. We can, um, um, at the end of your webinar, we'll ask you for your feedback. A survey will pop open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to our moderator, Heavy Reading's Principal Analyst, Gabriel Brown. Thank you, Becky, and hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Defining the 5G Network Connectivity Challenge. Uh, thank you all for attending today and uh, hopefully participating. Um, we hope the event is uh, useful and informative. The aim of this session really is to look at the requirements and solution for 5G network connectivity. Essentially, that means the packet transport that connects access with edge and metro data centers and then on into the core network. This connectivity layer must, of course, meet very demanding performance requirements. Uh, we're not going to talk in detail too much about 5G services today, but we know operators want to offer, uh, for example, ultra-reliable low-latency services, UR, LLC, and or to host 5G network functions in distributed cloud locations. Uh, in both of these cases, to make this work, operators need a high-performance and flexible metro network. And that's really the topic we're going to be exploring in the webinar today. My name, as you've heard, is Gabriel Brown. I'm Principal Analyst with Heavy Reading, where I lead mobile network coverage. And I'm joined by two uh, expert guest speakers uh, from ECI today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Moshi Shimon, who's VP Product Management at ECI. Uh, welcome, Moshi. Could you tell us a, a bit about yourself and, and what you do? Yes. Hi to everyone. Um, I'm handling the product management in ECI related to the transport and the 5G networks. I'm coming from uh, almost more than 20 years of experience in the industry, working from uh, Nokia Siemens and in ECI for many years. Okay, good stuff. Thanks, Marty. I'm going to also have David Stokes, who is Portfolio Marketing Manager at ECI. Uh, welcome, David. Could you similarly uh, introduce yourself? Hi, Gabrielle, and welcome, everybody. Yeah, I, I've been working on mobile backhaul for what seems like forever, that and optics and IP in various roles in various companies. And I'm really actually quite excited about what ECI can do in bringing uh, 5G and our knowledge of 4G into the market, and I think we'll cover some of that today. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, quite an exciting time for us all, I think. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Thanks, David. So during the preparation for the presentation today, we established both speakers are open to taking questions. We have a little bit of a, a Q&A time, well, some Q&A time uh, built in at the end of the, of the presentation. Um, but if where possible, I'll try and work in a few questions as we go uh, through the flow. Um, and so, you, you know, you can ask questions at any time during the event via the text box on your screen. I very much encourage you to do that and take advantage of uh, the speaker's expertise. So with that, I'm going to start with a short introduction before handing over to David and Moshi. So I just want to start very quickly by outlining the, the, the amount of activity, the sheer amount of activity underway globally by operators to develop and commercialize 5G technology. Really in every major region now, there are significant trials and pilots underway. Uh, I think you could say the, the, the US market is probably most aggressive, certainly very aggressive on timing. All big, all the big, uh, each of the big four carriers has, has said it's, uh, uh, it aims or hopes to launch some form of, of service in, in 2018. And that really runs right across the low, mid, and high band frequencies. So you, you almost have a kind of full ecosystem set of deployments within a, a single national market here uh, in the very near term. Uh, there's lots happening in Europe. Um, communicate things a little bit differently in, in terms of timeline. 
uh, part of that's cultural and partly perhaps you know they, uh, 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 I think a little a little a little way behind say six six to twelve months on on the US. Uh, but clearly we'll see extensive uh, trials this year um, and citywide launches coming in 2019 at some point before full commercial launch in 2020. Most of the activity in Europe right now is around the mid-band 3.5, but there's also bits and pieces on the low band at 700. Um, and then in Asia, uh, similarly very active, we have the Winter Olympics in Korea, South Korea just next month. I think that's long been earmarked as an event where uh, local operators and, and suppliers will be able to uh, showcase pretty standard 5G services, so looking forward to see uh, what they deliver there. And then we go to China, of course, there's a big focus on 5G and C band, looking for sort of 2019, 2020 kind of deployments. And of course, uh, in Japan, Docomo, probably for me still, the sort of bellwether uh, operator in terms of when it's aiming to launch a full commercial service, uh, which is looking to do uh, in time for the Summer Olympics in 2020. Quite interesting, that operator just announced its RAN vendors uh, last week, for example, or one of them anyway. So overall, very exciting in, in terms of activity. Um, now, just to, to add a little bit onto that in terms of the, the timeline, um, it is a little bit of a movable feast, depending really on your on your definition of what counts as, as, as full commercial and pre-commercial and so forth. So I've added this quote in. We actually get quite a good sense of you know what can happen in this line from the new um, CTO of SK Telecom in South Korea in an interview he gave with Light Reading, I think uh, last week or the, or the week before that. And here he talked about a time loan uh, for smartphone modems from various suppliers following freeze of standardization in December 2017, where we had the first freeze of what we call non standalone mode. So um, uh, from there, we can work through engineering samples on chipsets to uh, sort of what we'd recognize as commercial uh, smartphones, albeit somewhat low volume, coming in the second half of 2019, hence the the, 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 I think for, 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 for sort of deployments at scale, we're looking more along that kind of time frame, although we will see things uh, before then. Okay, so I mentioned just a moment ago the first standard uh, freeze uh, uh, came uh, less than a month ago, um, or about a month ago now perhaps. This refers to uh, the freeze for 5G new radio uh, phase one, if you like, part of release 15, and it's known as non-standalone mode, where you deploy a 5G radio on an LTE host network. Uh, so using an LTE uh, control plane for session management ability and so forth, and also an LTE core network. And the general view is this will be faster and easier to deploy, and you can launch 5G sooner. And that's the, the development track shown in red here on the chart. Uh, the, the second thread shown uh, in the blue arrow uh, across the top in the middle here uh, refers to standalone 5G known as SA or SA mode. This is where you can deploy 5G without any dependencies on 4G um, uh, and it includes a full system architecture, core network, control plane and so forth. Of course in many cases you will want to combine 4G, 5G network but you don't require to have the 4G network uh, to deploy SA mode. Uh, this is, as you can imagine, quite a bit more demanding uh, in terms of, uh, obviously, uh, development, implementation, and so forth, and so it's running a little later in the timeline. At the moment, from a standard perspective, it's about six months behind, just scheduled to freeze in June of this year. I think in practical terms, it's probably a little more than that in terms of when operators will be able to uh, deploy it. Uh, having said all of that, I think, um, while we expect the early launches to focus on uh, non-standalone mode, um, my view is very much operators will need to go to a full 5G system architecture to deliver some of the more advanced services in that, that, that we envisage for 5G to do that in, a, in, a, in an efficient manner. And so this idea of how you deploy uh, 5G in non-standalone mode and migrate to standalone has, of course, a lot of influence on your connectivity network and how you phase your investments and so forth. So before handing over to um, uh, uh, David and ECI here, um, I wanted to uh, just jump ahead a little bit to a, 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 what I might think of as a, as a kind of a target deployment architecture, the type of thing that uh, progressive operators are aiming for uh, right now and actually deploying and investing in right now. So 
you could, um, because first of all, you could think about, well, perhaps you would deploy, you know, if you're going for a full 5G uh, network, um, and uh, if you're looking to deploy, uh, uh, for example, you may deploy 5G core with distributed user plane, uh, centralized control plane, and that's shown in blue here. At these edge locations where you're putting user plane, you could think of this as perhaps a MEC or mobile edge computing or MCORD or, or some other acronym, next gen POP, next gen CO, and so forth. Uh, this is also where a lot of uh, services are likely to revive, uh, reside, uh, application logic, content, and so forth. And so we can think of this as a form of distributed cloud. Uh, we've then also likely to deploy some of the RAN functions here. They're actually shown in brown on the chart. Uh, say, for example, the CU or centralized unit component of, of 5G RAN. Uh, that's, that's what gives you control over, over radio resource management. Uh, and perhaps also in some places, the D or distributed unit. That's especially if you're uh, planning a virtual RAN and, and, and um, looking at a sort of a a centralized baseband type of models, quite a few ins and outs to that that, that, that have a, a, a lot of impact. Now this of course all needs connectivity uh, to connect these different locations and to uh, run services. I think in particular we need to think about um, uh, not just connectivity services but all the 5G network slices that we want to run over this distributed cloud infrastructure uh, uh, and importantly how we can map 5G slices uh, down into the transport network. So uh, there's a couple of things we need to talk about. But hand, just before I hand over then to um, uh, David at ECI, I have a very quick poll question for everybody here. My question is, um, uh, when do you expect to begin implementing 5G in your network? And you can see, are you already, have you already started? Are you, are you expecting to do so uh, very soon? Or you wanted to, three to five, six plus years? It'd be terrific if everybody could take that um, and just spend a moment or two while David gets ready to take us through the second part of the presentation here. Have a quick look what response rate we've had. Okay, quite a few votes piling in, so keep coming. Uh, keep them coming for the next um, uh, 10, 20 seconds or so. Lifting quite a bit, actually, the responses here. Okay, I'm going to push out live in three, in two, in one. And you can see uh, we have uh, just 11% uh, already implementing 5G, 16% uh, testing for immediate implementation, 40% in one to two years, and 26% three to five years, at 8% six plus years. Um, uh, quite a spread there. I think the largest group, one to two, um, I think that aligns pretty well with, with my understanding of the timeline. So uh, David and ECI, I'm going to hand over to you now. If you have a little comment on the poll, then um, please, please feel free. So uh, many thanks for that, Gabriel. And, and yes, uh, isn't it exciting? As I said, I said before, um, we seem to have been talking about 5G even as we started to first deploy 4G. So nearly 10 years ago, this initial conversation started. And I think it, it acts as a really good um, memory aid to remember that you know, 5G isn't going to be tomorrow. It's certainly the day after, and uh, we really need to start moving forward with um, solving those operational challenges. And uh, I think this very clearly shows that many people are already in this space and looking at how to move forwards and this standard, non-standard uh, deployment that you mentioned in your slides. So just to um, talk about or recap where the area we're going to be discussing today, and we're not talking about the whole of the, the 5G story. Uh, we could, but it, uh, it, it's very large and encompassing. We're going to focus very much on that connectivity fabric. This is the part of the network that links, the, obviously, the radio access technologies, to the core processing capabilities, the gateways, the service applications, etc. In previous generations of mobile networks, 2G, 3G, 4G, we've all known and come very familiar with this to be called the mobile backhaul network. And it was viewed somewhat as an overhead by the mobile network operator. 
and they're always looking to achieve this backhaul as cheaply as possible. And they do this either by leasing mo mobile backhaul or where cheaper they would um, uh, build it themselves, all depending on that cost profile. Um, but other than transporting traffic as cheaply as possible, there was little extra value or differentiation that they believed could be achieved from the backhaul network in itself. And today's LTE um, architecture is an evolution of those previous um, architectures in 2G and 3G. And we see tra traffic being backhauled mm -hmm. from Mino Bs at the edge to a centralized EPC uh, in a sort of logical hub and spoke arrangement. Um, in LTE, we did see some changes. We started to see the X2 interface being introduced, um, given a logical connection between the, the node Bs. Uh, we also saw discussion and a small amount of the deployment of small cells uh, and, and, uh, and a frontal interface. However, fundamentally, we still had a hub and spoke uh, type arrangement. However, 5G brings a fundamentally different set of architectures and needs a totally new and refreshed view of the transport network on how to support these uh, architectures. With 5G, we have the promise of the ability to provide a service oriented platform. And this platform has got to be able to support a massive broadband connectivity. This is very much an extension of what we do today. But in addition, it's got to be able to encompass now a huge IoT network that needs to be carried on that. In addition, we see the need to carry some new ultra low latency and or high availability services. And all these services need, need to be assured, have assured any to any connectivity. That, and this demands embedded intelligence that's distributed across the network. And this results in the need for a truly dynamic and distributed architecture. And this is a very uh, stylized view here, and Moshe will explain more later. Um, we've also, we've for a long time, heard about discussions and implementation of self-organized networks in the radio. This now needs to be extended into the connectivity fabric as well. The fabric must have the dynamic intelligence to autonomously meet each of the needs of the services on a service-by-service -service basis. Network resources must be instantiated across physical and virtual resources when and where they're required. In effect, we create an assured virtual private dedicated network per service. To achieve this, the traditional hub and spoke backhaul is no longer adequate. The transport network needs to backhaul multiple to multiple different points across the network, and those points will vary over time as well. Vanishing, being instantiated in different parts of the network, becoming bigger, becoming smaller. No longer uh, a have and smoke spoke type of arrangement. And in, indeed, I would say this is no longer actually backhaul. It is, in fact, an intelligent, high-capacity mesh network providing the full connectivity fabric for the 5G services. So my colleague, Moshi Shiman, will explain some of these things in more detail as we touch on how to implement the connectivity fabric, with these being the key main areas that we're going to focus on on the rest of today's webinar. Thank you, David. So when, uh, when we're analyzing the connectivity fabric uh, requirements to support the 5G services, different teams uh, should be taken under consideration. And as you can see in this slide, uh, we are starting with what is the requirement for the capacity and connectivity. And uh, when we compare the 4G to 5G, we are speaking about a factor of 100 to 1,000 in the amount of the capacity that we need to support in the connectivity of the base station inside the metro access and metro aggregation. The connectivity fabric should support network slicing. In addition to the support of slicing that you need, we need that need to start from the radio part all the way to the core. We're also referring to mobile edge computing in order to support the stringent latency requirement. A new synchronization requirements are enhancing the synchronization capabilities that we have today in 4G. Another requirement is related to the frontal together with backhaul. 
or in general we can call it XOL, and there will be a additional security requirement compared to what we have today in LTE networks. So these are the six main areas that are related to the requirements of the 5G transport network. Now, if we zoom in, we let's start with the massive capacity. So here it's uh, split into three parts. So we are speaking about, first of all, uh, the requirement to support much more capacity down to the cell site, on one side. From the other side, we are speaking about uh, increasing that the number of cell sites will increase also by factor of 100 in the same, uh, in the same, in the same uh, area, on the same uh, one kilometer square due to the fact that you need to support much more capacity to the handset or to the different type of services that run on the network. And for that, what, uh, what we foresee that uh, if today the, those sites are connected, the, the cell sites are connected with uh, 1 gig, in some cases even 100 megabit, it's going to be increased to, to 10 gig and 100 gig. And that will force the access layer and the aggregation layer to work with 100 gig from one aspect, but also to be to support integration of packet and optical capabilities like DWDM all the way to the to the access in order to be able to scale up above 100 gig. And from one side and from the other side also to keep the cost of the network in a reasonable manner. So capacity and pushing the 10 gig and 100 gig to the access that will be one, one solution for the capacity requirement. A second solution will be uh, integration of, uh, of DWDM multiplexing, like, uh, like OTN, uh, and the uh, different underlying technologies together with the packet. So we're speaking now of, uh, of platforms that will support packet and optical integration going all the way from layer one to layer three. And the third solution for the capacity grow will be what we, the thing we call flexible bandwidth, meaning that you need to design your network, not to, not to over-engineer that. You need an SDN control network where you can better have a better tight, tight, tight control of the bandwidth that you are provisioning. So you have, you have a more visibility using centralized, centralized control element uh, that give you uh, the full understanding exactly where your, where your bottlenecks in the network. And on top of that, uh, supporting uh, technologies like multi-layer optimization, optimizing the, optimizing the bandwidth from the packet layer to the optical layer, and vice versa, and taking smart decision where to, which part to, where to provision the required bandwidth in the most economy, uh, economy way. That's related to the massive capacity and connectivity. Moving to the network slicing. So network slicing is, is a, a new, a, it's adding, it's actually applying multiple service types on the same uh, physical network. It's meaning that uh, each service, uh, which uh, requires different delay, for example, or jitter, or scale, and so on, different criteria, will have the sense like it's working on its, on its private networks. So it's becoming, it's much more complex just to add VPNs because just to do logical separation, this is something which is supported for many already in the, in the past years on the, with using, for example, layer 3 VPN networks in the LTE. So here we're speaking much more stringent uh, separation for each type of service running on the same physical network. So uh, it's the, the, main, the main challenge here that we would like to avoid that there will should be zero impact from one slice on the another. So if, for example, as you can see here in the drawing, I have three type of slices. Let's say first slice will be for the smart devices, and the second slice will be for the autonomous cars, and the third slice will be for the massive IoT. I should guarantee that in any condition, the smart devices will not have the impact on the autonomous cars, and vice versa. And, and that's quite challenging today with existing packet network, because if you're taking a classical packet switch, regardless how much you, you tune the quality of service parameters, it will be very challenging, and there will be, there can be specific, some cases that, for example, in birthness, in birthness uh, scenario, 
one one flow can impact on another flow. So here we think we need to think of one of the uh, evolution of the transport network will be to implement new technologies uh, similar to what we have today with layer one with OTN and Flex C is one of the examples in addition to the packet capabilities. So we will for that the the, the combination or it uh, will be in a hybrid platform that from one side will have Flex C or OTN that ha will handle the very the ultra low latency slice while the the packet the packet uh, engine will handle uh, the, for example, the broadband traffic or the massive IoT traffic. And that's something uh, which will leverage the, the existing new hardware, and, and we can do also a more, a more, more, I call it, a smart decisions, which flow to handle in the different, in the different, with different slices. So what is Flexi? So Flexi, uh, just to just to give some high, some brief introduction about Flexi, Flexi is a new concept that uh, uh, we is a proposal to use for the transport network in order to support the ultra low latency slide. And one of the the, the main attributes here it's it's a new layer between the MAC and the FI. So we would like to get something very simple to a TDM like mechanism although we need to handle it in a packet, packet platform because we need to have the control plan connectivity, we need to have the oversubscription for the other type of services, but for very specific services that will be just fraction of the total traffic that will run in the backhaul network, the Flexi will give us, will give the option to the service provider to provide the ultra low latency slice. So you see here in the in the drawing, for example, I have three different type of slice. I have the blue one, which is the massive IoT, for example, and I have uh, the one which is more similar to the black, which is the mobile broadband, and I have in green the ultra low, ultra low latency, and each one of them will can use the different slice uh, that the Flexi will provide. For example, 10 gigabit, 50 gigabit, and 25 gigabit, respectively, and that will handle. There will be, there will not be any interruption or in, uh, between one slice to another, which is very similar, like it happened in the TDM, TD, in the old TDM platforms, and that kind of combination that we can do between uh, using Flexi, using Layer One technologies inside the packet platform. That's one of the solutions in order to handle the different slice in the transport layer. Another building block, or the second building block to support slicing uh, is using segment routing. And segment routing, um, it's a technology or it's a, a building blocks that give us uh, the option to, do a, a, to define the MPLS tunnel with a very uh, specific variety of metrics. Um, and we are speaking here about segment routing with traffic engineering extensions. So we can actually establish the tunnel end-to-end, -end, starting from the cell site router all the way to the data center with a very specific matrix. And while everything will be provisioned using the centralized PC, the path computation engine, which will be in a centralized way. And that's with that, we can give end-to-end -end the relevant KPI, which is related to the different slices. So if, for example, we need to, to verify that we want to have a slice with one millisecond, so we will use segment routing TE, and we will establish that all the way from the access to the core. It's also supporting the option to use overlay and underlay, because in 5G, some of the functions will be virtualized, while will others will be physical function. And we need to have the option to have, a, using, for example, new technologies like unified segment routing, to some cases to steer the traffic moving from the MPLS tunnel in the data plan, steer the traffic to the different VNF, maybe even to do service chaining, and bring it by, back to the pipeline all the way to the termination point. Uh, so that's the second building block, how to support 
the network slicing. Mashi, Mashi, if I could just in, interrupt you for a moment there. Um, a very interesting discussion, uh, uh, the, the, the last two slides in particular. Could I just uh, clarify, um, uh, I've understood you correctly. You're, are you positioning, say, flexi and segment routing as alternatives or competitors or, or more complementary? Can you just talk about the, the relationship a little more between them there? Okay, it's a good question. No, it's going to be complementary, meaning that uh, I will use the flexi for the ultra low latency as a layer one, using layer one technology, while in the same time I'm still working on a packet platform, but I need the segment routing as an, as an evolution to the existing MPLS, uh, MPLS tools that I, that I use today in the network, either it will be LDP or RSVPTE in order to guarantee because the segment routing T is adding additional matrix compared to the traffic engineering that I can use today. Uh, so I really can guarantee for the other type of flows the requirement of the latency, for example, or GTR and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I need okay, both of them. Yeah, okay, very good. And just very quickly on the, on the Flexi, what's your sort of understanding of um, standardization of Flexi and how, how broadly it's supported. So, you know, I, I come across quite a, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of support for it actually, particularly from vendors on for doing things like VRAN or ESIP retype transport, um, but also some, some resistance. Is that sort of fully standardized and interoperable at this point? So Flexi is, uh, is, is already standardized. Um, there are specific, uh, both ASIC and FPGA vendors that uh, have the support of Flexi. We in ECI uh, also developing the Flexi support in our platforms. Um, and like it's happened in, in the past with, uh, with OTN, uh, interoperability, uh, this is something that, that will be, uh, we're expecting that it will work with other vendors. Um, so the interoperability, if, if all the vendors will follow the standard, should be something um, that should not be a barrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, good stuff. Okay, let's carry on. So there's a couple of questions coming, but I think you have slides on them. So let's, let's carry on for the moment. Thank you. Okay. Another aspect when we're, we're referring to the uh, challenges that we have with the 5G transport is related to the delay. And uh, as we know, the, for specific services, we are referring or the requirements are for very stringent delay requirements. For example, low below than one millisecond. Now, from the other from the other part, if we are if we see the trend of uh, moving some of the services more to the centralized data center, and given sometimes even the distance, even if you're going with some of the, in some cases only with layer one, the delay that each element will will add. In addition to the, the propagation delay that we have on the light of fiber, it's almost not physical to support the one millisecond delay. So one of the solutions for that is actually moving the services much closer to the customers. So we will need, if we need to do so, and there is today initiation in the in the Etsy uh, in the Etsy NFV group that is speaking about the multi-access uh, multi-access. Uh, uh, edge compute, or it's in the past it was called also mobile edge compute, the Mac. So I um, can run now some of those, some of for specific services. I'm building the platform and I'm building the solution combined. In some cases, in some other cases, it's separated with the with the transport layer, where I can run these specific services very close to the customers. And that gives us several, several of advantages. So the MEC uh, can be decoupled, from, as I mentioned, from the, tra from the transport. And it's uh, from the other side, in some cases, in the access, in, in the street cabinet environment, when it's coupled with the transport, we can even provide offloading some of the compute power to the, some of the compute, uh, the services from the comp handling by the compute part to the uh, data plan, which is done by, by the hardware, and by that, by that accelerate the number of services and the capacity that we can handle in this location. So if we're moving a little bit to zoom in, this is the use case, for example, that was taken from the, from the Etsy, uh, Etsy ISG. And here, for example, you can see uh, video analytics and video management. Uh, so, for example, I have a feed of cameras that are connected 
with a 5G modem to the cell site. And now I can handle, I can run this video management by uh, on this on the Mac platform, offloading some of the traffic that I need, majority of the traffic uh, that now will not be, will not require to be backhauled all the way to the right side to the core, and also provide a very low latency response to any uh, any decision that need to be taken instead of going all the way to the core and coming back. And by that, we're reducing the traffic on the backhaul from one side. We're also giving the very fast response time. And we're just streaming to the core, to the video storage, just a, a, a more statistics and so on, and, and not the traffic itself. So this is just an example that can be many, many or different use cases by uh, using or leveraging the fact that we can run, we can run in the edge a different type of services. And for that, we need to build the Mac, the, uh, using the Mac architecture. So the Mac architecture is, is as you can see it here, it's actually, uh, we can split it to three main parts. The first part, the first part is the related to the, inf the virtualization infrastructure, which can be based on containers and hypervisor. And here it will include different building blocks. For example, I need to to handle the encryption. I need to do the GTP, the traffic, the tunnel is coming from the mobile to do the encapsulation and the encapsulation, for example. I need to be able to handle the overlay and underlay stitching and so on. So there are different building blocks related to the first part, which is the virtualization infrastructure. The second part is called the mobile edge platform itself. And that's related, for example, to uh, parts like handling the, uh, the DNS, location-based location -based services, the lawful, intercepts, the lawful interception, and so on. And there are different APIs, both to the southbound and to the mobile edge application. And on the left side, on the top, you can see the mobile edge application. So, for example, the video analytic that was presented in the previous slide will run as a VM or container on this mobile edge as an application, while the service provider will need to provide the infrastructure, both of the mobile edge platform and the data plan infrastructure to host and to be able to handle the different type of application. On the right side, you can see the management, which is very similar to the Etsy and AV architecture, where I need to manage the VM manage the infrastructure and handling the full life the full life cycle of the Mac platform. So this is just in very high level the building blocks, but the main idea here that in order the transport will have to be either to have the integration of the Mac or at least to do the handover of steering to the Mac platform. But the Mac platform should be located very close to the end user in order to support the delay requirement of the 5G services. The next topic related to timing. So timing, uh, it's a very important topic in general in mobile networks. And in 5G, uh, it's even becoming more complicated due to the fact that in 5G, in order we want, we intend to increase the capacity to the handset, doing, for example, using COMP and be able to connect the handset to multiple cell sites. But that bring, when, you're, when we are connecting to multiple cell sites, there will be very stringent requirement uh, for, for timing in order not to, do, not to have an interference between the different carriers. And what we can see here, that uh, if we are looking about the requirement, the accuracy becomes for the network is, is more or less related to 130 nanoseconds. Uh, to the overall network, where uh, if we're assuming we have around 18 hopes between the access to the source clock, it's meaning that each hope, uh, should the clock accuracy should be around 5 nanoseconds. And if we are, if we are uh, relating to the frontal solution, it's even, uh, we're even referring to 10 nanoseconds overall budget, 
um, and that require a very uh, specific or new solution how to handle this time uh, time accuracy. And um, the solution for that is based on a uh, on next generation uh, timing solution. Um, one side is, for example, having a uh, moving the GPS server very close to the, or in, even embedded that with the GNSS receiver inside the transport equipment. From the other side, we need to have a uh, support, of course, a boundary clock. And uh, we are now also referring to new uh, timing standards uh, that will improve the accuracy in order to support the five nanosecond that each element uh, can add uh, to the total budget. So just this is just uh, another aspect or very important aspect uh, when we are speaking about the 5G transport. Just quickly on, on synchronization, uh, Mashi, do, do you expect people to be deploying um, timing hardware at these edge locations as well, or do you expect to carry that all through 18 hops of transport as you're referring to? I know there's, there's different schools of thought there. Yeah. So um, in some cases, uh, we will need to move the the, the grandmaster very close uh, to the very close to the access uh, in order to support in order to support this requirement. Uh, but in some cases, you don't have the option, either because of the, in some cases, it's, it's in, in ter indoor environment or the, the rent of the location and so on. So you need a network uh, to support, uh, to, even if you have several of hopes, till you reach the, 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 the global master of the clock. So it's, it will be both of them, so, and we need to prepare, but at least from the, when we are, we are speaking with the engineering team of the service provider, they need to be ready for the two options. In some cases, it will be close to the customer, but in other location, because of indoor environment, a GPS cannot be placed, so they need a, a solution that the network will support it. Okay? Okay. The next topic, which related to the transport part, is uh, I want to speak is uh, the frontal solution. Um, so, if I'm going a little bit back, so due to the point that we are going to see very high number of, of uh, as we mentioned, of uh, cell site uh, to support the capacity, the bandwidth goal, um, just to go and implement a macro cell site uh, in this amount of number uh, will be very, very challenging. For the, from the CAPEX uh, investment of the operator. This is why um, we see more and more vendor, radio vendors and operators are referring to moving to the frontal in order to reduce the CAPEX and the operational cost of the base station. And in the frontal, just to a short, a short introduction, referring to the point that I have a, I have a solution where I'm splitting uh, or moving part of the processing and the logic of the base station to a centralized location. And uh, I have just, in the extreme condition, I have just an antenna where all the processing is done centralized. Then I can do over subscription and even I can even virtualize. And that's part of the concept called also, it was called Cloud Run and now it's called VRun, Virtualized Run. And the connectivity between the BBU, the, the now the centralized base station to the remote antenna, it's called frontal. And frontal, it's not a new concept. It was introduced almost six, eight years ago with quite, uh, I call it limited penetration due to the fact that it required using CIPRI, it required fiber, fiber all the way to the antenna and not in all countries, in an old city, for example, in Europe and in the US, it was quite challenging in the middle of the city to find available fiber all the way to the antenna. And this is why it has some barriers for the penetration. But now when we are referring to 5G, and as I mentioned, the number of sites and so on, um, we see more and more the demand to support the frontal as well. And analyzing, the, there are two main solutions to support frontal. The first one is based on Ethernet solution, where here I, it's called also ECPRI. And in the Ethernet solution where you can see on the left side, I'm building a frontal network which can which now can even using 
the concept also of max split. I can move part of the processing closer to the RRH. So now it's not a, just a simple antenna. It's an antenna with some intelligent with additional that can handle additional processing. And that reduces the amount of capacity, and I can use the Ethernet, which is much cost-effective technology. An Ethernet solution has a connectivity between the BBU on the right side all the way to the antenna. But it's not just a simple Ethernet switch. It's, it still has specific requirements called TSN, time-sensitive network. And this TSN it's, uh, requires a, a dedicated hardware, and there are today several of Ethernet switches that are working into this technology, for example, to support preemption or to support a new 1588 timing in order to handle the traffic between the BBU to the RRH. Another alternative is to use what we call layer one OTN solution. And here we are speaking about a solution which is based on DWDM with enhanced OTN in order to reduce the latency. This is more straightforward uh, solution. Um, to build an optical access with, of course, very stringent cost requirements uh, to, to build the simple, uh, sometimes passive or active DWDM in the access, so we are backholing the traffic. But here, oversubscription, for example, is something that we are not supporting, and for each RRU, we need a dedicated wavelength and then we are limited. We, are lim we have a limitation of number of, of RH that are you sorry that we can implement in the same ring, um, unless we are moving to more complicated WDM equipment. But then we, the trade-off will be, of course, the cost of the solution. And that brings bring me to the point that when we are speaking about frontal, we we need always to to remember that the service provider from one side there will be locations. As you can see here, that there will be a frontal access, but still there will be uh, the, the, the service provider will keep also the macro cell concept because not everywhere he would like to implement the, and also have the existing 3G and 4G networks. And this brings us to the concept of what we call X hole, meaning that the same backhole equipment need to support the two different technology and. If we spoke also, if you recall, when we mentioned the Mac, we can now also, if we are putting virtualization uh, capabilities engine, either integrated or externally, we can also now run the BBU in a virtual way. So we have now a CO, which is uh, occupied with a, a platform that's from one side supporting the front hall, supporting the back hall, and I can also virtual, supporting the virtualization of the BBU in the same location. And that's the future concept that we, that we foresee, how to handle the backhaul and frontal in the same platform. The last part uh, uh, that I would like to refer uh, of the topics related to, this, to the transport is security. So the security, uh, the fact that the 5G is mixed between physical function and virtual function um, what we see, it's, it's going to increase the network vulnerability. So it's not anymore a closed garden that we had the dedicated transport equipment from logs from specific vendors. We are speaking about a, a platform that we spoke about the Mac. We spoke about the fact that you we would like to do virtualization also in the transport part. So, and we spoke about the fact that we need to support the different flavor of, of uh, services in the same platform. We need, to, we need to take care about the security of the network. This is why what we will see, we will see more integrated cybersecurity solution to protect just the 5G infrastructure. Uh, we will see solutions that are going to encrypt either using layer one, layer two, like MaxSec or IPSec encryption of the traffic itself, of the data path. We will see solutions that are taking more uh, running a centralized algorithm that uh, collecting different logs from what is happening to the transport to big data analytics and then taking smart decisions, um, for example, terminating specific location and so on, changing the control plan and so on. And um, so all the part uh, of the part of the transport network should be handled as a, in a much more secure way it's handled today. 
due to the fact that we are speaking about mix of physical and, and, and virtualized function in the same layer. So with that, I would like to uh, hand up, handing uh, back to David. Thank you very much, Moshe. And so, sort of to bring it all together, we've seen from the, this few minutes you've been on the call that the 5G connectivity fabric offers the ability to link together this distributed intelligence across a distributed architecture and provide an assured any-to-any -any connectivity for those 5G services you mentioned at the beginning. However, the 5G connectivity fabric cannot be viewed in isolation from the rest of the 5G network. We've done it for the purpose of this to focus on the areas, and now we need to look at how it works with the, the wide picture. The orchestration of the 5G um, of the connected fabric must provide the instrumentation and the APIs to plug seamlessly together into the wider 5G radio and core service domains. It must also provide a clean evolution path from and for existing mobile generations, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G. We're not suddenly just parachuting 5G into the network from nowhere. We need to work out how we uh, incorporate and build upon those existing networks. However, in 5G for the first time, the connectivity fabric, the transport layer, has the potential to create differentiation for mobile network operators. And this is really new thing for them to get their, their heads around. We can actually use this transport layer instead of a tax, in effect, is a way of actually giving them differentiation. To achieve this, however, uh, advanced operational software will be required to take the network its full potential. This starts, as Amoshi has mentioned, with SDN control, orchestration, path com computation, and control of virtualized resources, but will be extended with machine learning, network analytics, and a seamless integration of best of breed tools. With a powerful combination of hardware and software, for the first time in mobile networks, as I said, this transport layer, this so-called connectivity fabric, really can add value to the mobile network operator. So, for example, the ability to have a very tightly controlled synchronization and to put the ability to monitor services right to the edge to allow operators to finally make augmented reality and uh, location-based services an actual reality. I mean, this was talked about at the back end of 3G, talked out again at the beginning of 4G. We never had the accuracy to pinpoint with mobile networks with the, the granularity that's required. With an uh, accuracy of 10 nanoseconds on the synchronization, we're able to locate a device to within a three-meter uh, box. That is enough to make these services start to really work and be powerful. And that's just one obvious example of the new services that can be done. So in summary, the, the way in which the transport layer can achieve this uh, value differentiation for the service provider is with a scalable transport, and that, of course, gives the table stakes. It must provide the connect connectivity to glue together the highly dynamic distributed 5G architecture. This performance is then further optimized, as we've been seeing by integrating mobile access edge computing, or mobile edge computing, whatever you want to call it, into this transport network. And then adaptive network slicing provides the real opportunity for service differentiating, especially when it's allied to ensuring the 5G services that travel over these slices. And finally, the connectivity fabric cannot be an operate, operated as a walled garden. It must give a seamless integration with the rest of the 5G infrastructure and pri provide a platform for best of breed, state of the art instrumentation, which will evolve as the 5G network evolves. So I think you can see from what we've gone through there today so far, there's a massive potential in this 5G network to really support um, the gamut of services which are, are required across, uh, across it. And so with that, I think we'll open the floor up to questions. I'll we'll hand back to Gabriel. Okay, good stuff. Thanks, uh, David. So I have a few questions coming in. A number of them have been answered, but we'll, we'll go through a couple. I wanted to start, maybe I could get uh, uh, your perspective, Moshe and, and David, or, or the other way around if you prefer. I wanted to go comment a bit on the phasing of um, 
of investment on on the part of the operator. Do you get a sense um, that the, the the operators you work with are, are looking to invest in transport ahead of you know deploying the 5G RAN and 5G core elements that they need, or are they looking to kind of move more in tandem? What, what kind of relationship are you seeing there? So, so I think. Um... In many of our customers, when we are referring to when we are ref, when they are referring to the investment, uh, for them it's also very important. Even if they are using today 4.5 or 4.9G, that the equipment that they are buying today is 5G ready. And uh, every service provider has, you know, the different plans. Some of them just will uh, start in 2020, 2021, but still they want the equipment they are buying next year and in 2019. In 2000 and in, in 2020, will support the, the main building blocks of for related to the 5G network, and uh, mm-hmm. so for them, the transport team, the packet team, relate and not always, you know, it's synchronized with uh, the the radio part and when they are doing the trials of the radio part, uh, but they still want to verify uh, that if we are referring to slicing or the synchronization part uh, or the scale that the equipment they are buying today will be able to run the 5G services when they're going to actually deploy it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, good stuff. Thanks. Um, I, I would add that, I would agree and add to that and say that um, a lot of the trials you see today um, and the statements of releases for the um, 5Gs for the, is for the 5G radio to actually uh, to put into deployment. Uh, running across an existing 4G infrastructure. But as Moshi says, that infrastructure, if they have to put extra capacity in, needs to be then have the evolution path to 5G ready in it. However, when we start seeing customers talking about 5G deployment, say at the Olympics, we really kind of make about getting that RAN area working to start with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, good stuff. Okay, next question. And then you may assume, just to go through the last couple of questions, I've put the uh, audience evaluation format to people's screens. Be terrific if you could fill that in while we just do it. Last couple of questions. Uh, thank you very much in advance. But a couple of questions around the same sort of theme here. What, uh, quick, I'll read this question out and then the other. First question is, will Flex E work on both fixed and mobile networks? And then basically the second question is very similar. Um, there's lots of talk about fixed mobile convergence in 5G. What are your thoughts on this? Um, well, either if you'd like to have a have a yeah. stab at that. Yeah, so first of all, Flexi is of course working on both networks and because it's less related to the it's let's say agnostic to what you're running on top of that. It's it's actually an enhanced layer one technology that uh, as I mentioned. Uh, replacing the OTN in one side, also improving the lag mechanism. Uh, so it's applicable for both type of networks. Uh, related regarding the uh, comment on the convergence, yes, I think uh, the fact that uh, some of the more and more service provider struggling with the best case flat ARPU, um, they are looking for the business case for 5G from one side, but they will not have, I call it, the privilege to build like happened in the past, parallel networks, so they will look for convergence. And part of the what I mentioned, for example, for mobile edge computing, um, this is why it's, it's, the name was also changed to multi-access, so we can also provide it for business services. Uh, so concepts like UCP, SD1, everything can be converged, and, and we can handle the same in, with the same infrastructure and the same solution, supporting both mobile and business traffic running on the same network. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good stuff. Um, so perhaps the last question before we close. There's a question here about uh, can you talk about SIPRI and eSIPRI and impact on RAM bandwidth needs? I guess you might be able to sort of outline all the different uh, SIPRI classes and so forth. But you, you mentioned in your in your comments um, you could do basically Ethernet or, or wavelength transport for, for front hall. Do you really see I have a have a particular view there, or are you just looking to sort of keep your options open depending on what your what your customers want to do? Yeah, I think that uh, that ECP will be more uh, 
going forward will be more dominant technology and due to the fact that it gives the, give the option to actually to use an Ethernet access with some, with some modification, as I mentioned, with the TSN support. Um, mm-hmm. But from the cost structure, it will, be, uh, it will have better cost structure compared to what we had in the past just using CIPRI with dedicated, dedicated wavelengths. Uh, so the fact that we will be able to do uh, over subscription, that's to my to my opinion with the max split uh, in order to, as I mentioned, to reduce the bandwidth and, and to move some of the intelligence or some of the processing close to the antenna. So uh, ECP will be a, a technology that will have better uh, chances to be uh, rolled out in in a, in a mass. Uh, a mass number compared to CIPRI uh, that we see the city till now. Yeah, okay, terrific, thank you. Yeah, I mean, so I, think, um, as, yeah. I think as we all know that the uh, CIPRI interface was never designed to do more than about 100 meters. Um, it was designed on the radio to be able to put the uh, baseband unit at the bottom of the antenna. And it was expanded a bit for small sound 4G, uh, just into the reach. It was never optimized uh, as part of the 3GPP standards. Now, they've spent a lot of time and effort on defining these standards over the last 10 years, and we have a whole range of uh, eight interfaces where you could have the split in different ways. And without spending an hour explaining all of those, there will be different functional splits based on different geographies between where what is in the digital unit and what's in the radio unit. And I think all options will be done in a network. So ranging from, as uh, Moshe says, the MAC layer split, a layer three split, and also uh, a simple ECIPRI split. So I think you need the flexibility to support what's required when it's required. And I think that's the whole story of 5G as well. It needs flexibility and dynamicity. Mm-hmm. Okay, terrific. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, close the webinar. I've just run over the hour. Uh, I'd like to first of all thank um, uh, David Stokes and Moshi Shimon from ECI. Thank you both, uh, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to thank everybody thank in the audience for attending and participating today. Thank you all very much and goodbye.